car attendees in. Welcome everybody to the second soup salad suffrage event hosted by the Office of Women's Policy, Women's Equality Leadership Council. Thank you for joining us. Sharon, I see you there today. Uh, I am so thrilled we can do part two of this today. Uh, we uh, honor the legacy of Selena Solomons and she, a hundred years ago, hosted soup salad suffrage for uh, lunchtime activities for women who were in the workforce and me really advocating for the 19th Amendment looked very different a hundred years ago. At the same time, the best way to honor is to honor their legacy. I recall talking with you, Sharon, about our, <laughs> our, our first session on August 13th. Yes, absolutely, Pratima. I, uh, I learned so much. I went through so many emotions hearing our, our, our speaker. And one thing that really made me think a lot was um, the women making tough choices. The women who had to make decisions on how to get the 19th Amendment passed. And I thought, you know, that's what we do as women. We face the tough choices and we make the tough decisions. It's nothing new to us. We were doing this uh, weekly, daily. We were just talking before about what's the best thing for our children as far as going back to school. What's the best way to keep them healthy? What decisions do I make? What decisions do I make about what bill can I not pay this month, but pay next month? And even in our own California assembly, you may have heard about um, uh, Buffy Wicks, who is a new mom, and she was in her office at the, the uh, Capitol in, in Sacramento and was called to the floor to vote on a bill that she felt very passionate about. She had her newborn there because she was breastfeeding the baby. There was no exemption for a breastfeeding woman to vote by proxy, so she picked up her baby and went to the floor and, and voted. This is what we do as women. We face the tough choices. We make the, the tough decisions. We may not agree with other women's decisions, but we get that they had to face tough choices. And you know, we do the best we can. And when we know better, we do better. Uh, oh, you couldn't have said it better, Sharon. To me, what I saw when I saw Assemblywoman Wakes on, uh, on every media platform was how far we still need to go, yes. right? And I'm reminded of you having dedicated your words at our press conference for the centennial. And for those of you, as you're joining us, we're discussing our soup salad suffrage panel from August 13th. We're talking about the soup salad, soup, soup salad suffrage panel today. And you know, Sharon, you dedicated your press conference remarks to your great grandma, Rosie, and you talked about she was the first woman in your family in 1912 to vote. I have chills as I say that, because that's, that's really seeing the action that came out of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And yet I'm reminded of what our keynote panelists said about the right to vote was in the Constitution, but our right is only as powerful as we exercising it. And that image of, of Assemblywoman Wicks to me is her exercising that hard fought right, her yeah. honoring the legacy of those who came before us. And, and, and you know, I really, you and I talked about how impactful mm -hmm. that was, right? Mm -hmm. Ab absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, for all the, the attendees here who have not, did ha not have a chance to hear the very um, eye opening, gut wrenching, uh, presentation that was done on August 13th. The Office of Women's Policy has it on their Facebook. They also have it on YouTube. And again, um, Pratima sort of uh, hinted at what what was covered. There was um, we learned we learned about so many things. Uh, the intersections of race and gender. I want to make sure I I highlight some of the really important ones. The inequities in advocating for human rights, the right to vote, the power of coming together as women. And I can't wait to hear what's in store today. And I know these women have made tough choices and tough decisions, and we all get that. Yes, yes. And with that, I want to welcome all of you to our second soup salad suffrage panel where we honor the legacy of suffragist Selena Solomon, who hosted lunchtime soup salad suffrage 
for five cents you got soup and salad but priceless was the suffrage that came with it um and yes um you know a copyright mastercard as soon as i use the word priceless i am a copyright lawyer by training uh, so I, I i can't help myself but i would say to us at the office of women's policy today your presence at this panel is an important reminder of how we need to intentionally to to intentionally build our work around what happened a hundred years ago mm -hmm. some of you heard sharon just mention about the intersection of race inequities and gender inequities that our suffragists a hundred years ago had to had to struggle and we also know that there were women who marched on the streets a hundred years ago like ida b wells like grace lee boggs who knew that they might not get their right if the 19th Amendment passed 100 years ago, and yet we came together. And today we're coming together. And I want to begin by saying our call to action panel today will do exactly what the suffragists fought for 100 years ago. What do we do so that we can have our voices heard and our women represented, elected, Leadership is not just a word for us as women activists, it's an action. And so today we will think about and learn about what that action looks like. But I am so excited to begin our event today with a youth voice. Our event on August 13th had a youth voice. Today's youth voice is Carla Mondragon. Carla, I'm so, so honored that she agreed to speak with us today at this panel. She's a former intern of the Office of Women's Policy. She's a graduate of the of University of California, Santa Cruz, who joined us once she finished her graduation as a summer intern. And I can tell you, you have heard often about the fact that having diverse voices at our table makes our product, our services, or our programming very inclusive. With Carla's internship, we had her working on a high school voter education project. And as soon as she joined our team, the work that uh, we were doing with Santa Clara County Office of Education and the League of Women Voters was something we handed over to her to research on. And she came back to us with missing pieces that she said were important so that all students in our community could identify and learn from the conversations about why voting is important. Without Carla's voice, we would have missed that critical piece. And that's why when I say diversity work is actual verb work. It's a verb. It's not, it's not a term that we use lightly. And to me, what Carla can do today for us together giving us a call to action is telling us I am part of this community and here's how you value my voice. So I'm going to turn it over to Carla. Thank you Pratima for your words. Um, hello. Hello everyone, I just first wanna say thank you to the Office of Women's Policy for inviting me here today and to all of you who here who have taken the time to tune in and come together as we continue the fight for women's suffrage. We are here because we know how powerful our vote is and we know that now more than ever, we need change. First, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. My name is Carla Mondragon. I'm a first generation undocumented woman. I was born in Michoacan, Mexico, but raised and living in the east side of San Jose since the age of one. I work for the Santa Clara County Division of Equity and Social Justice. And I was first introduced to the county last summer, like Protima mentioned, because I was part of the New Americans Fellowship, which is a fellowship program hosted by the Office of Immigrant Relations and gives DACA recipients the opportunity to work in local government. During my fellowship, I had the opportunity to be placed in the Office of Women's Policy and I worked on a high school voter engagement project, which, in which I focused on how to mobilize non-traditional voter communities. And I just wanna thank you OWP again for your mentorship and your support during my time with you and for reminding me how much power I carry. So as we talk about the need for representation in leadership, I wanna start with a quote from Congresswoman Ayanna Presley who said, the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. We have so many politicians, but very few public servants who work to ensure that everyone is being equitably and humanely served. We need people from our communities who breathe the same air as us, 
who attend the same schools that we do, that drink from the same water that we do, to, that understand what it's like to survive in the neighborhoods we're from, people that represent our needs, our stories, um, and us. We need to be talking about issues that are impacting our communities. We need to talk about why police continue to kill our black and brown communities, about immigration reform. We need to talk about climate change, about LGBTQI plus issues, about having access to quality and free education, about our sexual and reproductive health rights, and about being able to afford to live in, in our cities and about the ongoing gentrification that is erasing our history and our culture. Every day it gets harder for low-income communities of color, and especially now that we're facing COVID-19. We deserve a city, we deserve a county that we can afford to live in. We deserve a place that we can be safe and healthy in, while not feeling like our parents or our neighbors who are out on the front lines doing essential work are being treated as disposable workers in this pandemic. As an undocumented woman, voting is something that I cannot do. I arrived to the US when I was only a year old. My entire life has been in this country. This is all I know. And yet I still have no say in the loss and the decisions that directly affect myself and my family. Those who are justice involved and our youth cannot vote. And let's remind ourselves that the 19th Amendment only served white women. Black, Native American, and Asian women did not benefit from the passing of the 19th Amendment until about 1965. It was the sacrifices and the contributions of the women of color who played a pivotal role in the 19th Amendment passage. And we're still not there yet. To this day, we are still fighting against the barriers that disproportionately impacted by POC communities. I wanna take this time to remind us all about our civic responsibility, about the privilege, which should be a fundamental right that some of us have to vote. I encourage you all to vote, to run, to disrupt systems of power, and to elect those who are courageous enough to say no more. We need equal representation on all levels. We need to encourage our youth to vote, and we need to give them the tools and the civic participation opportunity that shows them how valuable and needed their voices are. Recognize the power that we have to change our workplaces, our communities, and this country, and let's continue to advocate and elevate for the voices of women everywhere. If there is no seat at the table, either we make our own table or we bring our own chair. Thank you again for inviting me to speak and um, thank you OWP for this opportunity. Oh, Carla, Carla, everybody, I, there are no words. Thank you. And you know, I, I, I am reminded of the words of Shirley Chislow, who is the first woman, first African-American, the first woman to seek nomination sorry, I'm getting teary-eyed, from our Democratic Party delegates so many years ago. And she said, famously, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And you just reminded me of that quote, because we need more of us so that Assemblywoman Buffy weeps when she asks for a proxy because she gave birth a month ago doesn't have to carry her baby to the floor of the assembly. And I, I, I think about how much more work we have to do for, I always say, the future is female. So for future, much like you, we have a lot of work to do. And the call to action panel today is perfect for what we are trying to do. The, the charge that you have given us you on behalf of so many who are advocating, whether silently or vocally. And for us at the Office of Women's Policy, it's taking longer than 22 years to dismantle patriarchy, but I can certainly say that we would never be able to do the work that we're doing had this county not had a vision 22 years ago to set up the Office of Women's Policy. And as we are thinking about the pandemic recovery, Everyone who's joined us today, I want all of you to find ways in which we can continue to advocate for women, for girls, for gender expansive youth. We are all looking outwards, inwards. And when we look inwards, we find our own stories. Today we're sharing our own stories, but from our stories comes strength. I see the story of Carla as a place of strength. 
why is it that we the community that that is people from all backgrounds all immigrant nationalities me as a first i i am a foreign born woman of color who's who calls this country her home we all together today look at your hollywood squares uh, webinar attendees our allies owp stakeholders that have joined us today look at your screen that screen and i paraphrase is our ancestors wildest dreams and we must remember that as we begin this work of remembering the legacy of those who came before us and recognizing what they fought for we are carrying on that legacy for those of us who call this this community our home and at the office of women's policy for us our work is not complete without community and carla walking with us is community our panelists walking with us is community we all of you joining us is community and i know that we together will continue to elevate the important issues but also tie it back to the way this amendment was passed to the fight that came before us you see sharon on your screen she famously said hard won not done i remember the day 15th of january 2020 that was the day that virginia became the 37th state in the nation to pass the equal rights amendment and here we are it's still not a constitutional amendment sharon reminded us when we think of 19th amendment hard won not done i can see the t-shirt with that my friends and for all of you who are joining us i would say for for the work to matter for our actions to be meaningful and for our communities to be represented we need to have diverse voices diverse experiences and varying expertise because that's what makes us powerful together for us to be one and and i am reminded that our work is not work that's a zero sum game when carla said a seat at the table it doesn't mean that somebody has to leave the table diversity my friends inclusion my friends belonging equity this is not a zero sum game it is where we all make the pie bigger because we're all part of this when i train on diversity and equity i talk about a quilt i want each one of you to imagine a quilt and i want you to imagine what that quilt represents different the, the di different people who have different backgrounds different um fabric types that you see on the quilt different textures that you see on the quilt all of it stitched together that quilt together is us and i would say to me the most powerful message is that quilt coming together today um Sharon, do you have any more um, things to add before I introduce our electeds? Uh, no, I, I I think everything has been well said. Just one one comment on my behalf. You know, uh, I'm 72, and I turn it over to you. I am so proud of the young people. I am so proud of the women who are stepping forward. Carla, for you to say. you know that you can't vote yet your voice is important just is just so magnificent and so i am thrilled to be the senior citizen because this world my country my county my city is in such great hands so thank you thank you all <laughs> well and and you know that that that's what i mean the future is female my friends that's how i look at the power of what we can do together and and yes not only is harla a representation of our future we think of who is it that we're fighting for it's carla it's all of the people that that represent our legacies that's who we're fighting for and i would definitely say oh i'm looking at my email because there is um there are links i would definitely say whenever you think that this fight 
could not get harder. I tell you to think about, sorry, there's a plane going overhead. One, two, three, four, five, six, done. I, I tell you to think about the picture of Assemblywoman Buffy Wicks holding her one month old baby, voting, voting for us, voting because that's who, that's who an Assemblywoman is. She represents us and she represents a mother and she represents a woman and she represents someone who's taking care of our future. If Sunday happened, I would say our work is still cut out for us. In the social justice world, what I like to say, put me out of a job, make equity a reality, put me out of a job, that's your charge. And with that, I am honored to introduce Vice President Mike Wasserman, who's known for having, this is on his bio and it's beautiful. And every time I say it, I'm thrilled when I say it. You have a head for numbers and a heart for people. Santa Clara County Supervisor Mike Wasserman was first elected in 2010 and then reelected. And to us, he is a longtime legislator who comes into our community with having been part of our community all his life working from the ground up for the people is who we see Vice President Mike Wasserman as. Um, I would be failing in my duty if I didn't tell everybody. He serves on 28 committees that are only 24 hours in a day. Supervisor, I don't do that, sir, so what do I know? Uh, but the most important committees that I, I, I'm reminded of is the Public Safety and Justice Committee, where every time we present our work, uh, Supervisor Wasserman does have encouraging words. We're trying to get to zero incarceration of girls in Santa Clara County, and he is one of the board members who supports us in our work. And um, finally, he was the one who led the Board of Supervisors to recently find funding and open a 37,000 square foot no kill animal shelter in the County of Santa Clara that'll start in 2021. Yeah, I read up your bio, I follow your work. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Supervisor. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Protima, thank you. Thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to serve with the four members that I do on the Board of Supervisors. They all have big hearts, big concern, for all people and making Santa Clara County the very best place that it can be each and every day for everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I wish we could all be together in person, but I am happy to be able to speak to you even if it's virtually. America was founded on the belief that all people are created equal, but it was not until nearly 150 years later that the 19th Amendment was passed, granting women the right to vote. And here we are nearly 250 years later after declaring independence and our nation is still grappling with what equal means. I wanna share with you a quote I read recently from Alice Paul, a leader in the women's suffragist movement and author of the 1923 Equal Rights Amendment, which has yet to be adopted. Her quote, I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated, but to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality. Very well said. I am proud of the County of Santa Clara's leadership on the advancing women's rights and working towards creating a more just community. And like I said, every single member on the Board of Supervisors supports this wholeheartedly. I am proud that when the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors voted to establish the Women's Equality 2020 Leadership Council, it was the first in the nation. We wanna commemorate and honor women's suffrage and to advance women's equality and women's rights in numerous ways. Educating people about the historic fight for women's rights is crucial, but there is still so much progress to be made. As a lawmaker, I take my charge very seriously to uphold the Constitution and to work with all of you to improve the lives of all people in Santa Clara County. When planning for honoring the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment started, COVID-19 didn't exist. Holding public events to honor important moments in history have not been immune either. This pandemic has changed all of our lives in so many ways. I applaud the work of Protima Pandey, 
what a force, huh? The Office of Women's Policy, the Commission on the Status of Women, and of course, the Women's Equality Leadership Council 2020. They have all worked tirelessly to ensure that residents can celebrate this historic event in meaningful ways, despite the restrictions placed on us by the pandemic. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Alisa Camahort Page. Alisa is a speaker, writer, and consultant, best known as the founding COO of Blog Her Incorporated. Alisa was there at the birth of the social web revolution, building a grassroots phenomenon into a national women's media brand with 100 million web users, holy mackerel, and thousands of conference goers. After selling Blog Her and leaving the acquiring company, Alisa turned her attention to social and civic engagement in the wake of the 2016 election. She became the co-author of the Roadmap, of Roadmap for Revolutionaries, Resistance, Activism, and Advocacy for All, and the host of a podcast, The Op-Ed Page, with Alisa Camahort Page. Alisa lives in San Jose with her spouse and her cats and is dedicated to helping people figure out how to operate at the intersection of technology media, inclusivity, and social impact. Let's welcome Elisa. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce one of today's three panelists, Erin Velarde. Erin is the founder and CEO of Vote, Run, Lead, the nation's largest and most diverse training program for women to run for office and win. She first launched the program as Vice President of Program and Communications at the White House Project. Erin has also served as a leadership development consultant for a range of clients, including Fortune 100 companies, Global Girls Initiatives, and the US Department of State, reaching women leaders in dozens, of, excuse me, dozens of international cities. She has appeared on the main stage on CNN, BBC, and Fox News. Erin's work was featured in O, the Oprah Magazine, Marie Claire, New York Magazine, as well as numerous international and domestic articles on women and leadership. Please join me and welcome Erin as well. Thank you. Thanks so much for those kind intros, Supervisor Wasserman, I really appreciate it. I'm going to introduce another supervisor who will introduce our two uh, remaining panelists. So please uh, join me in welcoming Supervisor Joe Simidian. Uh, Supervisor Simidian was elected to the County of Santa Clara Board of Supervisors in 2012 and has been reelected twice since. He represents District 5. On the Board of Supervisors, uh, Supervisor Simidian serves as Chair of the Health and Hospital Committee, Chair of the Board's Federal Affairs Advocacy Task Force, and Vice Chair of the Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee. So he's got a pretty, pretty busy agenda as well. But his public service has gone on for years. He was a California State Senator for the 11th District and a California State Assembly Member for the 21st District. Supervisor Simidian has received many awards and accolades and recognitions, including Legislator of the Year awards from a wide range of organizations, including specifically relevant to us today, the National Organization of Women. So thank you for being here, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Really, really my pleasure. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, and, you know, just really a delightful opportunity to celebrate the day, uh, even if it is virtually. Um, I, I was asked to share a few words before introducing other members of the panel. And if you'll permit me, I, I'd, I'd like to speak a little more personally than I usually do. I, I look at the, the celebration and, and can only be reminded of growing up uh, for the first 14 years of my life being raised by a single mother. And, uh, you know, she struggled to make ends meet and to support our little two-person household. And... Uh, her passion uh, professionally was her work as a classroom teacher, 
but she had the misfortune of working for one of the last school districts in Massachusetts that had two separate salary schedules, one for men and one for women. And I think you know which one was lower. And this wasn't a wink and a nod sort of understanding. This was, uh, you know, a, a formal de jure. It was the rule. Um, and she fought and fought and fought and uh, couldn't make that change happen during her tenure. So ultimately, she had to leave the job uh, that she loved, the career and calling that she loved, which was teaching kids, uh, because one day she literally couldn't pay the dentist bill. Um, so, you know, off she went then uh, to break new barriers as a computer programmer, uh, back when uh, nobody knew what a programmer was, and there certainly weren't many women in the field. Uh, she had to deal with the challenges uh, back in the uh, early six, early and mid 60s of working in a male dominated industry. Uh, ultimately, she ended up taking her talents to work for the Department of Defense, working with the military, which was not always hospitable to uh, talented women in its, in its midst. And, um, uh, you know, I grew up hearing about and uh, slowly but steadily developing some understanding of what those challenges were and, and how they were made manifest in real people's lives, including my own little household. Um, I, I share that because whenever we talked about things that were wrong and that needed to be made right, uh, that was when I got the lecture from my mother about the importance of voting. And there wasn't an election day that she ever missed. It was always important. She always had an opinion, I can assure you of that. Uh, but one of those opinions, which she shared with me and which is uh, just part of the um, family value that I grew up with was, you vote. Uh, it's a precious thing. It's uh, a, a, an opportunity we should not take for granted. And her point to me was that every injustice that we encountered along the way would, could ultimately be addressed uh, at the polling place, in the ballot box. That uh, individual struggle was essential on a day-to-day -day basis, but that if we were gonna see the kind of systemic change that uh, she was uh, so um, dedicated to, uh, that we had to do it at the ballot box so that it happened for everybody. And as we uh, take part uh, in the celebration today, and thank you again for including me, I, I hope that we are reminded uh, just how vital this uh, franchise is to the effective governance of our uh, country and, and to a more just society. It, um, doesn't obviate the need for each of us to do good works in our daily lives and in the way we carry ourselves. But if we're going to see the systemic change that I think we all agree is necessary, <clears throat> excuse me, it's got to happen uh, at the polling place. And thank you for making that possible. Um, we're going to hear from um, some uh, very talented women shortly. And as it happens, I have the opportunity to introduce two wonderful women uh, who are part of the program today. Uh, and both of whom are uh, folks I know pretty well. Uh, Nisa Flieger uh, is um, currently a council member and the vice mayor of Los Altos in my district. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, when uh, she was running for office, uh, the first challenge she had was for people to be able to understand and pronounce her name, just like with Semidian, I'm sympathetic, Nisa. And uh, so uh, if I heard it once, I heard it a dozen times. Nisa rhymes with Lisa. Flieger rhymes with Tiger. It's Nisa Flieger. Uh, for those of you who uh, see the name uh, and want to know how to pronounce it properly, uh, but Nisa's got a long history of uh, public service. I first got to know her uh, when she worked here in the county council's office uh, at Santa Clara County, uh, and um, she was such a talented professional who could be absolutely determined and rigorous in her work while still carrying herself with a graciousness and a dignity uh, that I wish we all could emulate. Uh, she went on to uh, serve on the um, health board for our health, El Camino Healthcare District uh, in the North County, uh, and then was, uh, as I say, elected to the city council in uh, Los Altos, where uh, she and I serve uh, now uh, representing the same folks as colleagues in government. And uh, that has been a, a really very satisfying partnership. So let me express my thanks in this forum 
uh, and uh, her day job, uh, she tells me, uh, is at HP. Uh, I don't know where she finds the time to fit that in, uh, but I know she uh, is um, uh, also a, a loving spouse and a mom and has uh, an adorable daughter who uh, is um, not camera shy, I can tell you that. Uh, so uh, uh, Nisa, it's just really a delight to be able to introduce you and um, a delight to, to know that a person of your caliber has chosen public service. And then in the political realm, uh, Susanna uh, Delano, who is uh, the executive director at Close the Gap California. And um, I, I have to say, I have a, a little bit of a bias here since uh, Susanna works uh, with as executive director at Close the Gap uh, with the founder of Close the Gap, a wonderful woman named Mary Hughes, who just coincidentally is my wife but I'll stay focused on Susanna's good work uh, because uh, she is gonna take the organization, she is already taking the organization to uh, new heights, uh, an extraordinary uh, set of accomplishments just in uh, recent years uh, when uh, we were at a, an all time low uh, in California in terms of uh, the number of women in our state legislature, uh, the efforts of Close the Gap and other good partners and allies has now pushed that number to an all-time high. I shouldn't say an all-time low, I guess the all-time low in modern history and now an all-time high. So thank you for that, Susanna. I know from my work in the legislature how important it is to have that mix of voices in the room, those life experiences, that range of perceptions that just isn't there if everybody isn't around the table. So thank you for making that not only possible, but happen. Uh, Susanna's work is informed by uh, years of prior experience with Planned Parenthood's legislative advocacy group. So uh, the healthcare, reproductive healthcare rights that uh, we enjoy here in California are in part a result of Susanna's hard work uh, to make that real at the legislative level. And even before that, she was working with uh, home care workers to make sure that uh, they had the resources they need and the compensation they deserved uh, to care for the uh, neediest and the frailest among us. So again, thank you for including me in the day, but uh, congratulations to you all. Thank you for all you have done and will continue to do. And again, at least as I hand it back to you, uh, what a wonderful uh, pair of women I got to introduce in both Nisa and Susanna. Back to you. Thank you so much, Supervisor Simidian. Uh, and welcome Nisa, Susanna, and Aaron to this panel on getting out there and running for office ourselves and what it takes. I'm so happy to be speaking with you all. I actually wanna also thank Supervisor Simidian for using the word obviate. It's one of my favorite words. I never hear anyone use it. And I was like, I felt really redeemed and validated there. <laughs> Um, so um, I want to dig right in. Of course, everyone has heard your very impressive bios and um, I, you know, I kind of want to get into the topic at hand. So Susanna, because you're drinking, I thought I would just sort of start with you. Thanks, um, thanks. So Close the Gap, as I understand it, um, you know, looks for women basically to finds, recruits, and vets women candidates for office. So why don't we just start at that beginning of the process? Um, uh, I would love to hear a little bit about how you transitioned from working in repro rights to working in getting folks to run and whether you thought of running um, yourself and then what it is that you look for when you're finding, recruiting, and vetting women candidates. Great. Well, thank you. And, and thank you, Supervisor Simidian, for the introduction. Um, as he mentioned, I was working at Planned Parenthood prior and then for about a decade before that with SEIU on behalf of home care workers. Um, and, you know, half of my work was on the electoral end, half of my work was on the policy end in both wow. roles. And over and over, you know, I always had kind of a generalist role, but also writing political plans for each year. Like, this is how much money we want to raise. This is how we want to spend it. Here's who we want to um, prioritize getting into office. And something I've started to say a lot is every single political plan I ever wrote ended the same way during those almost 20 years, which was we need to be recruiting candidates and we need to be doing it early, years and years before uh, the election at hand, because we were always in the position of picking from a very limited pool of candidates who had made it all the way up to, you know, the, the line for endorsement. And just so often, we did not see the caliber of champion on our issues, um, whether it was, you know, labor and 
uh, healthcare, uh, reproductive care, and it was just so clear working inside politics that the field really takes shape and forms way far in advance. You can't just decide to run and then be on the ballot a month later. You really need to be going two years later. So when uh, Mary Hughes approached me about um, getting involved with Close the Gap, I just, I, I jumped at it because honestly, I felt like I had spent so much time playing defense at SEIU and Planned Parenthood, always under attack, always trying to, you know, live another day and make sure that essential services could be delivered, that there just was not enough resources left over to go on offense. And to me, Close the Gap is going on offense. I know I'm starting with a sports analogy here. It's all downhill, <laughs> but um, it's a chance to actually go out and actively form the field. So, you know, at Close the Gap, we start by targeting districts, and those are the districts we think progressive women can win. Um, whether it's an open seat or a seat that a Republican holds, but the district is starting to turn purple and we think a progressive woman could take it over the, the finish line. And so um, we start there and um, begin to recruit. And uh, we consult with a lot of different allies. Um, we really look for a woman who's a great fit with the district. Um, you know, a, a progressive woman running in the Central Valley is probably gonna be a little bit different in terms of her path and her allegiances than a progressive woman in Berkeley. Um, or Santa Monica, for example. Um, but we really look for someone primarily who has an authenticity within the community, you know, regardless of how long she's lived there necessarily, but has established really substantial um, substantive ties to the community that helps with fundraising ultimately, but it also, there's no substitute for that relationship with the voters and being seen as someone who is really positioned to lead. So um, that in a nutshell, I know you asked a number of questions in our in a row there, but um, that, that's our approach to really um, just um, infuse progressive women into the pipeline. But it's, re it's really interesting to me that you start geographically um, and then find the person within, um, which uh, I think is, is not maybe the way I, not having no uh, experience in this, would have thought of it. Like if the, first you find the great people and then what can you do with them? So I think that's a really strategic approach that it's um, super interesting. Uh, Aaron, I know with Vote Run Lead, well, first of all, I know that you've been in this game, particular game, for years because you were with the White House Project, <laughs> yeah. which was, I think, the kind of the OG, right, in, yes. in getting women to run for office. And right. then you, when that was getting ready to wind down, you sp spun out Vote Run Lead. Um, and uh, you, I'm also curious, uh, Susanna, the one question you didn't answer is if, if you ever thought of running for office. Um, so, but we can get back to that. Um, I kind of have the same question for you, Aaron. Um, but um, so, so tell me about Vote Run Lead's part in the chain sure. of getting women to run for office. And, um, and if it's different from Close the Gap, I know you work nationally, but I, I think it is a different part of the chain. And really one of the things when you talk about the skills that you're helping people develop, I would really love to understand them in the context of how you think they are in the context of regular skills, professional women or, or even not, not white collar information workers, but what, how do they relate to regular skills that women are developing all the time um, and may not be thinking are applicable to running for office? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and thank you so much for having me on, Elisa. It's always a pleasure to see you, connect with you, uh, and everybody today. I'm just really happy to be a part of this and so glad this is part of the um, celebrations. So at Vote Run Lead, we are training women to run as they are. Um, and the mantra and the curriculum and the programming is called Run As You Are. And it is trying to have a mindset shift around who can lead, what a politician looks like, um, what are the skill sets actually that belong in public office because we're really trying to break the mold. So, you know, I think prior to 2016, we very much saw ourselves as a, you know, a bit of a feeder into the pipeline. We were going after very unusual suspects, communities that did not get a lot of electoral activism, maybe got the GOTV, get out the vote efforts every two, four years, but didn't get the kind of political infrastructure. Um, we partnered all around the country with women's funds and foundations. You know, the California Women's Foundation is big, has a policy political component. Not every um, women's fund has it, but those women's funds and foundations actually have a huge grantee network. Um, and this was, was Marie Wilson's um, genius out of the White House project, which was to tap those grantees um, and to have a long-term vision for when they would run for office. And so we, when we, um, 
spun out from the White House project, those grantees were running for office. Um, they, that, that five, 10 year plan that so many of the alumni said was that uh, was coming up, you know, that term was coming up. And, you know, I think that began to happen, but I also think the cultural shift of, you know, waking up uh, in 2016 and many women, especially in our network, um, you know, felt a loss um, and, or were surprised um, and very much had a reaction to look at their local offices and to see that some of the very same uh, leaders who had been there for 20, 30 years, who had headshots from the 80s, right, still up on the city and county websites, um, and just didn't see the, the correlation like, hey, we almost had a woman in the White House, but we don't actually have any women in our city councils. Turns out this record number of women in Congress is only 25%. Yeah. So um, we began to see women who were accelerating their cycle for two years and saying, I want to run for office. I want to do it right now. Now-ish, you know, mm-hmm. now-ish in politics can be a year or two years out. Uh, what do I need to know? Um, and we really work hard to you know, our belief is that your experience is your expertise, the other stuff we can teach you, right? And you may need a little upgrade on budgeting, right? You may need to go take a course on sort of the amount of money that's gonna come through, say a county commission. Um, But the basic skills of connecting with your neighbors, serving as a proxy for the, you know, wants and needs of your community, for, you know, being able to take a bunch of diverse opinions and come out with the best outcome. These are skills that that we're doing on a regular basis and we can't discount the experiences and places that we do them. So that's what we're trying to do at Vote Run Lead. Yeah, I think that's such a great point is, is that um, we already have to negotiate outcomes every day, no matter what your life is like. Mm-hmm. And that's really listening, synthesizing and negotiating outcomes is kind of what it's all about. And we all have to do that in some form. One panel to prepare, one thing that we talked about that I loved that you poked holes in is that I had heard, and I think we probably all heard this metric that, um, that it, you know, a man has to be asked once and he'll run for office and a woman has to be asked seven, six or seven times. I can't remember what the meme is that goes around about women, but it's very similar to how they say women don't ask for raises or women don't ask um, for promotions and the latest survey data from McKinsey when they partnered with Lean In was that women ask, they just get told no more often and the way they have to ask is different. So you kind of poked a hole and said, that's not even based on a real thing. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. My <laughs> good friend over at um, Center for American Women in Politics, Debbie Walsh, really debunks this well. Um, it, but what it does speak to, I think, is a lot of the unlearning, right? Is, is we don't... Um, we, we often aren't from childhood encouraged in the same way to be political. Um, you know, there's just, there's a lot of unlearning. So while the encouragement helps, the encouragement helps for both men and women. Um, mm-hmm. The other big thing that we see is that so many women never saw themselves in public office, right? It's still an anomaly to see women of color at the highest ranks. It's why people tear up when they see Kamala Harris as a VP, whether you love her or not, right? It's why everyone on the train when Condoleezza Rice was appointed, you know, 10 years ago had the paper open and the subway of New York City because we, we just don't get enough of seeing ourselves where men on a regular basis see themselves, the self-identification allows them to say, that's a possibility for me. So we're, you know, those are all the things that are, we're starting to unlock. And that, while the encouragement does help, um, I love the generational shift that we're seeing at Vote Run Lead where young women are like, well, I want to be a United States Senator. So right now I'll be X, Y, Z, you know, and they've got, you know, political ambition. Boom, boom, boom. Um, you know, they're not afraid. Ignite does a great awesome. job there in California of doing that political ambition and, and make and normalizing political ambition in by showing role models who look like Nisa, right? Who are like, oh, that's what you do? I didn't know that. I could do that, you know? And it's that kind of, um, that's that kind of role modeling that we need. Well, I always, I always, to that point, have this personal story of my nephew, who is uh, African American, who, when he was seven, he was seven when Barack Obama was elected president. And the next, that next year in school, when they asked, you know, they do that, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said president. And he had never said that before. And it was just like the most, I don't know, it's the most wonderful thing. So it really is, if you, you know, you, you got to see, uh, you can't be what you can't see. Some people do, like some people do. It's a lot harder. <laughs> for sure, but it's a lot harder. So that brings us all to you, Nisa, the one, the, the, the elected official that we have got to wring all the information and uh, opinion out of. Um, so tell us a little bit of your story. When did you, um, 
when did you decide to run for office? How, how many times did someone have to ask you? What did you, um, had you always thought about it? And who were your role models? Who did you see that made you want to be um, vice mayor of Los Altos? And what do you want to do next? That's one of my questions. <laughs> so many questions, Elisa. I know. <laughs> and I don't think Susanna and Erin answered your question about whether or not they thought about running. Well, We'll, we'll get back to that. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so first, let me say I am so honored to be invited to be part of this panel. I'm sitting here and I could be easily an audience member because I am learning so much and I'm enjoying hearing all these different stories. Um, I hope everybody listening in, calling in um, is doing well, um, you know, all things considered. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, I also want to especially thank Pratima and the Office of Women's Policy. And as Supervisor Sumidian mentioned, I worked for the county um, for a little over nine years, and one of my clients was the Office of Women's Policy. And I always enjoyed the work that I got to do with OWP. And so it's such an honor to be working with them in this different capacity and hear about the wonderful work I know Pratima and the rest of the team um, are doing over there. I also want to thank Supervisor Sumidian um, for the introduction. I think it's very fitting um, that he introduced me. Um, we go way back. Um, but I will say, as I talk about my journey, you know, what, one of the things that's key to me being where I am today is having champions like Supervisor Simidian. You know, when you think about when I ran, and I'll talk more about what got me to run, uh, but, you know, I'm currently the first Black council member in Los Altos ever. Um, and the population, the African-American, uh, you know, Black population in Los Altos is 0.4%, which really equals to about 150 people out of 30,000. And so for someone like me to decide I was going to run for city council in Los Altos, I needed champions. And Supervisor Samidian was one of those champions. And I do want to recognize him uh, with two quick stories. One is, you know, I had him listed as one of my endorsers on my materials as I was going door to door when you could do that. Um, and I will tell you, there were so many people who saw Supervisor Samidian listed on my endorsement list and say, oh, if Supervisor Samidian is endorsing you, you have my support. And I know that made a big difference. He also mentioned I served on the El Camino Healthcare District Board, which is an elected body, um, and a seat um, opened in 2017. And instead of calling a special election, the board decided to appoint someone. And it was Supervisor Simidian who recommended, wrote a letter. And I think that made the difference that got me appointed to that board. So I really just want to thank him and I really appreciated his introduction. Um, and Sarah was in the paper this week, Supervisor Sumidian, and so we all know how that, what happened with that picture. It's all over the house right now. Uh, but thank you, um, Elisa, for that question, my journey. Um, I am a planner, Erin mentioned there, you know, we have a lot of people who come to them now and say, I want to be a U.S. Senator. They scare me. I'm not that much of a planner. Um, but I do think ahead and, and I've always been drawn to leadership. I've always been drawn to public service. And so I've always looked for opportunities to do that. And this goes all the way back, you know, to high school. I was valedictorian, I was student government president. Like I was always involved. I enjoy giving back. I enjoy, you know, using my skill sets um, to do good. And, and, and I, I get something out of this. So I enjoy doing it for other people. Um, and it's, it's self-gratifying. Um, so since high school, I've always been interested in government, public service, you know, in undergrad, I majored in political science, international relations, knowing I wanted to go to law school, but also knew I didn't necessarily want to practice law. It was a stepping stone to public service, because for those listening, you know, there are many ways to get to elected office or public service, but you will see that a lot of people will get a law degree as one of the first um, steps in doing that. And so I went to law school, graduated, had a lot of student debt. And so even though my passion was public service, I went into private practice first in order to pay off my student loans. Um, did that for uh, several years and then decided I was at a point in my career and life where I could make the switch to public service. 
And I started looking at city attorney's office, county council, and that's how I ended up um, in the county council's office in, in, in Santa Clara County. And you know, it was exactly what I needed at that time because I really wanted to understand the nuts and bolts of how government works, the different departments, how they work with the community, how we serve the community, the different social services of, as a government entity we can provide. And so I got that very valuable experience at the county of Santa Clara. Um, and while I was doing that, I also started to get involved locally in Los Altos. And you know, there are many ways, um, there are many paths to elected office, and, and I will describe my path, um, but I wouldn't want anyone listening here to think it's the only path, because as I said, I'm a planner, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, if, you know, if I could go back 10 years, I would do a, a lot of things differently, because you make decisions based on what you think you need to do or based on your understanding at the time. And so my understanding at the time was, you know, you had to volunteer, you had to get involved, you had to serve on committees and commissions, you know, you know, so the community could see you as a leader. And I think for me, for different reasons, I think it was important for that to happen in Los Altos. So while I was working at the county, you know, I served on the grant writing committee, I was vice chair, I became chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission, I did the Los Altos LEAD program, um, and I also did Emerge California. And if you've not heard about Emerge California, it is a training program for Democratic women interested in running for office, even if you're just thinking about it, please apply to Emerge or one of the many other organizations out there because, again, it was part of my journey um, and it really helped me get to where I am today. So, you know, started volunteering in the community and as you get more involved and you demonstrate your skills and your leadership qualities, um, you know, people notice that. And so one of the things, you know, you need to do, and I, I don't think this is optional. I actually encourage everybody to be authentic, be your true self so that people can really identify who you are and your strengths and recognize you for that. And I think that started happening in Los Altos where people started asking me to run for city council. And so to your question, Elisa, about whether or not, you know, someone had to ask me, I always had an interest. You know, I always had an interest in running for office. But in 2016, the first time I ran, it was because someone you know, a couple people actually recommended that I run in 2016. One of the reasons um, was there was an open seat um, and they were telling me, Nisa, don't wait till 2018. You don't need to do anything else. You know, you have our support. We all know you will support you. Um, in 2018, there'll be two incumbents. You want to run. Your chances are much better if you run when there's an open seat. So I quickly got my team together. And, and, and when you think about your campaign team, you know, people call it your kitchen cabinet, you know, different groups have different terms. I really reached out to people I knew well, I trusted, I knew they supported me. And a lot of these people did not have a lot of connections in the community. And, and eventually we had someone on our team who had those connections. But for me, it was very important to have a very close knit supportive team as we strategized about how would we really roll out my campaign in Los Altos. And so I ran in 2016 um, for city council and I lost by six votes. Uh, wow. I know. I know. Um, and, you know, it was disappointing. It was discouraging. It was 2016. So there was a lot of disappointment after that election. Um, but I wasn't discouraged. And that's another thing I would love to convey to all those who are listening who are interested in running. You know, never be discouraged. If you know you want to run for office, you know, there's no straight path there will be twists and turns. So you have to be resilient. You have to be determined. And, you know, just keep focusing on that goal and figuring out, okay, you, I lost. Why did I lose? And are there things I can do to better prepare to run again? Um, and that's when the El Camino Healthcare District Board opportunity came up and I stayed involved. And I'll quickly say I ran again two years later um, and I won, got the most votes, um, got the most votes in every single precinct in Los Altos, which has never happened, mm -hmm. uh, which was a big win and a big accomplishment for the team because I had, you know, most of the people who worked on my first campaign came back in 2018 because they really believed that my voice could make a difference in Los Altos.
And so that's my journey, um, Elisa. Um, and now I'm serving as vice mayor of Los Altos and I, I am so happy I did it. I'm enjoying the experience. Um, wouldn't have it any other way. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. What a great story. And I love, um, you know, the fact that you got back up after losing the first time in such a tight race. I mean, that would be so, I don't know, frustrating and like, ah, oh, and, and just got up and did it again. And Aaron, I, I was going to ask you as you were listening to this journey and as if you think of other folks that you guys have worked with at Bo Run Lead, you know, what are the lessons that are typically derived when someone runs and loses? Um, you know, do they, do most people, are most people as resilient as Nisa in your experience? And what lessons are, can usually be taken from that kind of experience? So running and losing is tough. You know, I, I, um, I think Nisa might have skipped yes, over the part is. where it was like <laughs> heartbreaking, right? And yes. I, <laughs> yes. um, for months. <laughs> yes, yes, because I think there is, uh, it's not just a personal loss, right? As you talked about your team with love, um, it, it is, you, you do feel like you're, you're letting folks down and both research shows this and anecdotally, we know this at VRL, women take it really hard. We take it really hard when we lose, um, and, you know, so there is, um, my, my chief program officer, Pa Kuhang, actually ran for public office, lost, didn't run again, um, but has this beautiful letter to herself um, that we've started to incorporate um, that sort of helps you to build that resiliency. You know, resiliency is a muscle just like anything else. And so it, you have to recognize that. You have to give yourself the opportunity to let that sort of uh, disappointment flow through you, get in and out, right? However long that takes, months or weeks. Um, and I think there was, especially at a time like 2016, even in 2018, we had an alumni who ran for Congress who lost by this much when the wave of women, you know, and she was down at the Capitol to see the other women sworn in. Um, she got on her, you know, big girl pants to do that. But it was, it's tough because you, um, you do really invest so much in, of your family. You've made so many sacrifices, but we are finding that more and more women are running again. And we've been talking quite a bit. Um, I just actually heard a story from my we were going through some of the alumni. We have nearly 300 alumni who are running this year, um, just you know, in local offices and congressional offices. Um, you know, we did a we did a webinar that was like, you know, oh shit, I lost. Right now, what? Um, and she had taken that webinar and said, you know, I I get that we have to give each other permission to do that grieving, right? So that's one of the lessons. But so many of the women who are running for the first time don't have Nisa's story. So they don't have this sort of civic capital, this political resume. And so that, that campaign that they just ran was a huge learning experience. And you need mm -hmm. to go back and go, hey, you know, what could I have done differently when we're at that place to say, okay, maybe I, um, you know, turns out I didn't have the support I thought I had from this community. So I've got to go back and, you know, go dig a little bit deeper into that. Or turns out maybe I did need a couple more surrogates or um, gosh, I needed to raise twice as much money. You know, I'm thinking about Corey Bush, um, who's an alumni of VRL, who has now defeated a 10 term incumbent, you know, a kind of a political dynasty who made a lot of significant changes to her campaign infrastructure, kept the core the same. I think you heard Nisa say that as well. You know, the core values, the core team, the, the people who you want to stand by. But, you know, she had to go out and raise big money. She had to, you, you know, she had to do things differently um, in order to, in order to, in order to make it successful. Um, and it, and that still was a close race. So, you know, at the end of the day, all, it is really always though about the voters and understanding what the sentiment of the voters were um, at the time. And, you know, not to, to take that time to grieve, but the big lesson is like, all these guys lose and they run again and then they run again and then they run again. And you're like, oh, if Joe Schmo's doing it and he can get, you know, the party to back him 18 times, I'm sure I can get the endorsement again, right? Um, and so what we see is when these unusual suspects run, especially when women of color are running for these big congressional seats, the next year, people are starting, we're starting to retire. Um, they may not have won, but they definitely shook up the agenda that was happening. Um, so the policy things got talked about that were never talked about in that district before. So you also want to count your wins, right? Even though you had a loss and that you're not the representative, there were wins in there that you want to keep the same. So those are some of the lessons I would share. Oh, that's great. Thanks. And I did want to mention to folks, you can use the Q&A a function in Zoom. We're going to spend the last five, 10 minutes like with some questions um, that uh, from the audience. So please do submit your questions if you have any. You, you aren't going to get too many chances to have so many um, 
experienced and expert speakers who can talk to you about this topic. Um, so one of the questions, Susanna, that I wanted to ask you uh, when we, after our first meeting, I was like, well, Nisa, you know, she is obviously like super impressive, always had this in her mind. I don't know why being a lawyer is such a stepping stone to being a politician, but it is, but she's a lawyer. She's like a leader outside politics and, and um, she, you know, she seems like pretty tail, like the perfect candidate. Um, so for those of us who maybe, you know, don't have her professional degree, don't, haven't always thought this was in our game plan, haven't made these efforts to be so, I mean, like your list of activities in Los Altos alone um, would wear me out. So for those of us who, who don't, ho- aren't so obvious there, it seems obvious, you know, like they're obviously a leader who are really into this and a perfect candidate. Um, what are you looking for? What can, what can people do to develop their leadership opportunities to make them more excellent prospects for running for office? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, for, for me, it really goes back to what I spoke to at the outset about an authentic relationship with the voters. If you are someone that you're, community already organically looks to as a leader, even if it's just a small sector of a community, then that's your building block and you go from there. So if you've been active on the PTA, if you've been active with, you know, Moms Demand Action, Black Lives Matter, if you, particularly if you can point to some accomplishments on behalf of the community as a result of advocacy, that's helpful. Um, And I think what women are able to do sort of uniquely in many ways is, um, and our founder Mary Hughes talks about this, it's three-dimensionalizing your network. You know, if you're a mom, if you're taking care of your parents, if your kids are involved in sports, there's all these different hats that women wear, um, you know, as we go about life being bosses and multitasking. And we can draw on each of those to really become a three-dimensional candidate to the voters and show all of those different faces and it's a strength. So um, th- those would be some of the, the things we definitely look for. And as far as you know, more practical ways to build a profile, um, like I said, you know, leading a local effort, it could be for a park, it could be for a veterans memorial, um, it could be for a rule change or a, on a traffic issue. But, you know, the more that you're seen as a convener and someone who's able to be effective, uh, the better. So um, visibility is also really important. I often recommend to women who are just starting out, if they are not super well known, look for, you know, start a blog, get on podcasts, um, you know, just look for a way to sort of be this steady voice in the background um, that is speaking about any number of different issues of concern to the community. And and the more you do that, the more you're going to have traction once you start to run. I think uh, something in um, in our our book, the Roadmap for Revolutionaries, in our chapter about government, we focus mostly on local and and not so much on Congress and and the federal government, but on local. And interviewed a, quite a number of candidates, um, but also some appointed folks. And Nisa, it's part of your story that you were on the Hospital Commission. Uh, for those of you who are local here in the Bay Area, we are very county driven. Our counties have commissions on every possible topic. Most of those are appointed positions. And when I interviewed people who had been on those variety of commissions, they really, you know, their biggest advice was find the topic you're passionate about, start showing up to those meetings. Those meetings are public. And those, you know, a lot of those commissions have openings all the time. And so it becomes quite natural to say, oh, we have an opening. Um, You know, you've been coming for a year. You obviously (laughs) care. Like, let's just appoint you. So I've I have just personal friends who were on the library commission or the planning commission or the uh, juvenile justice commission, just to think of three off the top of my head. And in our area anyway, these are really working commissions. They do a lot of valuable stuff and make recommendations to the county board of supervisors and make change. And it's just a great way to get visibility with the kinds of politicians who can then become your mentor um, like Supervisor Simidian was, and um, and get and to the point about seeing how government works and seeing how it's done. Um, so for those of you who are in this area and who are listening, like look around every county, like for Santa Clara County, it's scc.gov and go to the county commission section. And there's just a huge list of commissions and they'll tell you exactly which ones are open and look for the open ones 
in your district because your supervisor gets to pick or gets to you know, uh, suggest. And, that, and then that's another thing you could do, which is start going to your neighborhood association meetings, your county board of supervisor meetings, your committee. These things are all open to the public and, and this is where you get to meet the folks who can become your mentors, who can become your champions, who can become your appointer, as it were. Um, and so that's one thing I always tell people a lot is that look, look for those opportunities. The other big opportunity I often bring up is schools, if you're a mom. Schools, um, first of all, school boards are usually an elected position, but um, there's school committees as well. And there's a lot of policies in schools. There's a lot of there's a lot of meat to what happens in a school that needs people to activate around them and to care and to like want to, um, like we talk about in the book, um, dress code policies is one example of something that is often really outdated or often really inherently either sexist or racist and can be really improved. But it takes, if you're the one who can drive some well, much needed change that can, again, really help you get to know people in your community, get to be seen as a leader. So I really think there's so many opportunities um, that you don't have to start by running for office. Um, and then you can see how you like it. Like, I was going to ask you, Nisa, like what, um, I obviously want to know whether, what's the best part of being in office and do you think your identity has, has allowed you to bring a different perspective to issues and that you can really make change in a different way? But then I'm going to ask you what is what is kind of the hardest part. But let's start with the good stuff. The like, good stuff. <laughs> what, what what do you really enjoy, and how do you feel like your identity allows you to make more substantial or different change than people would otherwise make? Thanks, Elisa. And let me go back to something you said earlier. There's no perfect mold, um, and so you know, especially thankfully in in today's political world anybody and everybody can run for office and win. I just wanted to say that for all those listening. Um, and, you know, I enjoy serving um, and that's the good part where, you know, if, if sometimes you really want something, you work really hard to get it. And then it's almost buyer's remorse when you get it. It's not what you expected. Um, that hasn't happened yet <laughs> with serving um, on city council. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience. I love being able to make decisions about safer routes to school that I know impacts my kids, my friends' kids, my neighbors' kids. I, I you know, I'm very excited when I get to promote any kind of environmental policy. Uh, you know, I said a lot of this when I was running, and so for me, it's following through on my commitments. These weren't things I said I believed in and supported. And then when I got elected, didn't do anything about them. Uh, so to be able to do these things I was hoping to do is very rewarding. Um, you know, going through COVID, um, a lot of cities, as you may know, have been struggling with their financial situation. Um, fortunately, Los Altos is not necessarily in that situation, but we still have to be financially conservative. We don't know how long COVID is going to last. And we also, as many other cities, have felt the impact. But even knowing that the mayor and I were the two council members who really pushed for our city, even though we wanted to be a little bit more conservative, we pushed to have donations be made to CSA, which is a community services agency, um, to the local women's SB domestic violence group, to the chamber, the business group. The mayor and I really worked on this for weeks, and it took a couple meetings for us to really get all our council members on board with what we were proposing. And I was very happy with that outcome. You always wish you could do more. Um, but I was very happy to have that voice and partner in the mayor to really push for these things because, you know, even if Los Altos isn't suffering, even if we don't have a lot of Los Altos residents directly impacted, we have to think about the broader community. And if we can play a role, if we can contribute, we should. And I was happy we were able to do that. Um, so the other part of the question, um, you know, the, is, it, is it the bad side? What have I not enjoyed? What's surprising? Uh, so, you know, I am very, and you hear this said about a lot of um, female um, elected officials that were more collaborative, um, you know, we work better together. Someone actually wrote a letter in one of our local papers saying, not so much with this city council because Los Altos has an all female 
council, um, the only existing all female council in California, second ever. Um, And so, you know, we're all women and we obviously have a lot in common, but we also have differences in policies, how we approach things or decision making. Um, And so, you know, being someone who I think is collaborative and, you know, solutions oriented, um, I am, I am, I, I do find it surprising. And I think even if I had, you know, male counterparts on the council, how much it takes to really collaborate with people on council. And I think it has a lot to do with you're in a public setting, you know, and everybody has their own supporters, their views. Um, and so really trying to get to that solution for many things, it takes longer than, you know, you're coming in, you think you have this brilliant idea um, and you're willing to, okay, let's, okay, I'll compromise on that. And you think, okay, you're gonna get to a compromise but acceptable solution. That process as a legislative body takes longer than you can imagine. Hmm. And if there is a way to cut through, because I, you know, I, I, I want to get solutions, I want to get things done. Um, and so that's the part that's challenging. And it has a lot to do with personalities too, and understanding people's motivations um, to figure out how do we get to a solution uh, so that we can move forward. That's a very consistent piece of feedback I got from the people I interviewed too, which is that <laughs> It's government and people sometimes dismiss government as bureaucratic or so, but the reason it takes longer is because it's not like someone's the CEO or the dictator to say, boom, this, you know, government is not efficient and that is often its benefit. Um, But sometimes I guess it's its frustration too. Um, So Suzanne, I'm going to come back to you and say, um, have you ever thought of running for office? I can't avoid thinking about it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's your life. It's your work, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll say a couple of things. I, I'm very comfortable behind the scenes. And I think that's part, you know, my, my character. I mean, just even being in an executive role is a big deal for me. But I think it's also by way of background. I, I started out my career in politics working on behalf of union members for 10 years. And, you know, if you're doing your job right as a union organizer, you don't say a word. It's your members are up front. Um, but I do think that that's a trait, just, you know, that, that collectivism, the we, not I, um, is something that, that women often will talk about when, you know, they're getting into why it's difficult to fundraise. Am I coming through okay? I saw it freeze for a minute. No, I, I hear yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, I, we had an event with Senator uh, Maria Elena Durazo back in last November. I remember before a huge labor leader, very inspirational to me as a young person, in Los Angeles, but you know, she got really candid with her group and just talked about how difficult it was for her at the outset of her campaign for state senate. You know, and this is as a labor leader with a national profile who stood up to, you know, corporate giants and and just won epic battles on behalf of her members. Um, but she said she really felt uncomfortable until she got to the point where she realized it is about we, it's not about me, and kind of returned to that that collective mm. spirit. You know. Um, both her and I working in unions that were primarily made up of women and low income women and and majority women of color. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would just say is I think the the only thing that would compel me to do it would be if I really saw an impact that I could make and and if I was the only one who could make it. And I I think that's worth bringing up because what we find, um, you know, there's, there's this idea that women need to be asked seven times and they're so timid and meek and why me? That's really not the story. Women have lots of great options. We have lots of good things to do. Um, and a lot of times, you know, what really, what we find really pushes women over the edge and gets them to decide to run for state legislature is when they really get a sense of the impact they can make. And it may be that they're in local office and they just feel kind of at the end of the impact they can make in that setting and they want to take it up a level to work on statewide education policy, for example. So, you know, um, I think those those are kind of what goes through my mind when I think about it. But I don't think you can expect to see me running anytime soon. (laughs) I'll be hanging out with my 13-year-old watching (laughs) me become a teenager. All right. Well, thanks for (laughs) indulging the question. And remember, folks, if you have any questions about running for office, or I would also say about supporting someone running for office, and that's something I wanted to ask you about, Erin, leave them in the Q&A. you know, we, we have some time at the end that we can ask some questions. Erin, I am going to ask you if you have ever thought of running for office, but I, then I also want to talk about all the ways 
the, the mechanism of running for office and there's a lot of opportunities there. So what about it? Have you thought about it? Well, like, like Nisa, I was student body president and I, you know, I've, I, all those good things. You overachievers. Um, yeah. <laughs> well then when nobody runs against you anymore, it's a, it's a little bit easy. And my mom came up with my slogan who hasn't realized that she's made a few Facebook live appearances today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do think it's, you know, something that's in the cards for me. Um, but right now I have, um, you know, I think that's what you're asking about is power, right? And so how are we all flexing our political power? And, you know, you heard Susanna talk about how she sort of flexed her political power. And I think um, I have this very unique job in this very unique time when there is a major cultural shift for taking big risks on women, taking big risks on women of color, taking big risks on black women that we have never seen in this country before. And so I feel a real responsibility to, um, to fundraise and, you know, for the, on behalf of the organization, on behalf of some of the women and to put my power and energy there. Um, because I do think I have, uh, you know, I understand the privileges that I have just walking in the world as a white woman and um, as someone who's privileged enough to pay her own salary, right? Um, those, those freeing things. Um, I wanna see, I wanna do everything I can right now to, to really capitalize on this shift because I don't know where it's gonna be in a couple months. Um, I don't, you know, I think there's, there's this larger conversation happening in the country about who we wanna be um, and how we wanna operate. Um, and I feel really dedicated to um, a particular worldview there uh, <laughs> um, that, you know, really encourages me to stay with this and to continue to have this sort of sea change um, and permanent sea change, right? Because I think we've seen like in places like California, we've seen this spike in a couple of states where things go up and things get better. Um, but there's a real permanence that needs to happen. There's female majorities that need to happen. It can't be an anomaly that Nisa sits on, you know, one of only two all female city councils in the country. Um, those are the things that in the 519,000 seats that are elected and the probably half a million that are appointed, we have less data on that. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that we've really got to make permanent. Um, and I get the opportunity to be like thousands of women's campaign manager in a kind of a way. So that's always fun. Well, speaking of campaign managers, I think that is something to point out to folks, although we were here yeah. today to talk about running for office. If you don't feel, if one oh. doesn't feel, right. Themselves. Um, there's a whole life and career you can have supporting great candidates who run for office, correct? Life and career you can have. Um, and a desperate need. So like what? Yeah. And, yeah. and a need for women because we still, one of the things we're finding is there's still a lot of bro culture. There's still a lot of young white men that are running these campaigns. You know, when I call, um, I'm not going to name them because these guys are great, right? But when I call some of the most like radical, amazing women, I get their like 32-year-old white boy chief of staff or campaign manager. And I'm like, hey, you know, I love them, right? But it's like the, that bench is actually, it's sort of reflective of the public candidacies you see of women and women of color. So that's a big bench to go after. Lots of great places that you can, you know, learn those skills, but also just jumping on a campaign it's not rocket science, you know, like you can learn on the job. This is one of those learn on the job. If you are a fundraiser in the nonprofit sector or you've raised money or you've done sales, like take those skills and consider, you know, hosting house parties, becoming a, you know, if you're not the sort of development person for that, you know, what can you do? You can uh, commit a goal to raise $10,000 to somebody, you know, you can babysit for a woman and watch her kids. And, and there's sort of network, that network power of not having it be formal, but what are the things that get lost in the cracks or that men don't have to deal with that we know, you know, it's like, I will pick up your laundry every week or I will come every Monday night and I'll do everybody's laundry and you will drink wine and complain and I will, you know, do the thing. Um, so, so there's all sorts of levels of the formal campaign, the informal volunteer of making phone calls or writing postcards all the way down to just being sort of a sister friend and being like, yep, call me anytime when you want to fire someone, but you know, you can't. You know, so there's a lot of ways. Um, it's really making, putting yourself out there. Um, I love this idea of being a virtual volunteer. We're really pushing that right now, Boat Run Lead. Email a campaign, say you wanna be a virtual volunteer. Um, email them twice, maybe even three times because they're busy and they're lost. They don't have enough staff. So, you know, email them a couple times, maybe put a couple skills that you're good at, where they can reach you, follow up with a phone call. Um, 
you know, consider being a poll worker if you're young and healthy this year and you want to get a, you know, up close glance at what's happening. You know, the elderly make up a majority of our poll workers and for very good reason are not doing it. Um, and so if it, this is a choice and a risk you have to take, but if that, if that's one, you'll, you know, that's an interesting way to just put your, your toe in the water. So lots of different grades of how you can be involved, but you've got to put yourself out there. That is great. That is great advice. All those ways. There's so many different ways you can find the one that fits your skills, that fits your level of comfort. And then you may find your comfort zone expands. Um, as, as Aaron said, you could dip your toe in the water and then you may find eventually you're just jumping right in. Yeah. Um, but there are so many ways to like dip that toe. And for um, young I, women, there's this big push right now for graphic design and a little bit of social media. And so there's this whole pool because of the shift towards digital for, you know, or if you ever wanted to go back and get a second career, I'm like telling everyone and their mother to be a graphic designer, right? Um, because we now are living online. And so the marketing that we have to do as candidates has really changed. And so there's a whole yeah. new set of skills that um, if that's something you you work on the side would be an awesome fun thing to offer. Every candidate is going to have a TikTok. I'm just warning (laughs) you now. So, Um, so thanks. Those, those are all great. Um, Well, I guess I will have to say final words of advice. I was going to ask each of you. And I think really, Erin, that was some great words of advice. Um, Susanna, do you have any final words of advice for people who are considering this, uh, this journey themselves? Um, yes, I might try to sneak two in. One, be strategic. <laughs> one what? Be strategic. Um, just underlining the point about open seats, close the gaps model, that's where we start. And the, the numbers are really stunning. If you look close at them, we had, I think it was 355 women ran for Congress in 2018, record smashing number. And of those, only 14% of the women that challenged incumbents won. On the other hand, about half of the women that ran in open seats won, and of course they make up the majority of the new class. Um, so just look for that opportunity as, um, as Nisa said to, you know, looking for that open seat so you don't have to go contend with an entrenched incumbent when you get there. The other thing that just is on my mind as I watch candidates work through this cycle and struggle, it is hard out there and just be mindful that you are part of something bigger. Um, You're part of this massive generational shift um, that has to do with racial justice, that has to do with gender equity, um, a lot of the things uh, that we've heard about from Aaron. And ultimately the point is that that's how we transform the political reality and the day-to-day reality. Um, If you're sick of the campaign finance rules, there's no, I don't believe there's any way we're gonna change those without more diverse progressive women serving in office. Um, And in fact, there's someone running um, locally who comes from a campaign finance reform background. So um, that is what gets me out of bed every day is knowing that we can only transform through doing something big. And whether it thinks about the fact that we live in a white supremacist patriarchy or not, uh, you're going to get confronted with that as a woman candidate um, when you're out on the trail and it's going to be tough. But this is how we change things and it really is historic. Thank you. Nisa, I give you the final words of final last words of advice. I'll be quick. I second everything that Susanna and Erin said. Um, And I will just add, you know, now is not the time to sit on the sidelines. It really isn't. And as we celebrate this 100th anniversary, the real way, an authentic way to honor these women that fought for us to have the right to run for office and vote is to get involved. Um, You know, one thing I love about Emerge California is similar to what Erin was saying, they identify different roles women can play in a campaign. Um, It's funny, my campaign manager, you know, it was female and it never dawned on, it wasn't as if I intentionally picked up, and and most of the people on my campaign were female. Um, And I remember when I was running for office and there were so many women candidates, it never occurred to me that it was possible that we would have an all-female candidates because it's not a big deal in my mind. You know what I mean? Like I, I think and I, and I look forward when everybody views our community and society in that way. Um, so please get out there. Let's make this the norm where we all run, we all get involved in whatever way, join a commission, join a committee, get that visibility. Yep. And, and, and please, please vote this year. Um, and I see Pratima um, putting a li- lot of links in the chat. Please be a poll worker, whatever it is, just get involved. And thank you so much for calling in. And thanks, Elisa. Great job. Oh, thank you so much. And yes, absolutely there. You've just seen right here, we have three different groups. There's so many resources. Emerge, 
uh, vote run lead, close the gap. There are, and there are even more resources to help you run if you're thinking about it or to help you get involved. What Michelle Dauber and I talked about in the first one was that I really want to emphasize as a closer, our, our constitutional rights are theoretical when our feet meet the street. Um, and the only way we can, we can really try to protect them is to vote for people who we think will do more to protect our rights than others. So it's really important to get out there and vote and to be part of the process. I also want to thank the Women's Equality Leadership Council and the Santa Clara County Office of Women's Policy for making this all possible. Um, it really was going to be a series of in real life events and they turned on a dime and created this whole virtual series. And want to see you on September 17th is going to be our final discussion in this three part series. So um, go back to the link where you signed up for this one and please join us on the 17th as well. And pro team I will hand it off to you. Thank you so much. I can't even begin to say thank you. Thank you seems such a small word right now. What you did today, the panelists and Alisa and our supervisors, we got together and we really made this a call to action. To all our attendees, we will succeed if we work together. And yes, we shouldn't in 2020 have only the second all women city council. That, that's not what we want to be. We are going to change it. And together, we hope we have learned a lot of good tips, learned about how to dust ourselves off and keep moving, as Nisa said. And as Susanna said, look, there are ways for us to create community. Come together. I, I will say, Erin's work with Vote Run Lead is incredibly important as well because that's where we find our community. Next time on September 17th, we're going to talk about our final mobilization strategy. We learned about the legacy on, October, on August 13th. Today we had our call to action. Now we'll have mobilizing on September 17th. All are welcome and our amazing facilitator, Elisa, again, Deep, deep gratitude for making us all walk on the road to revolution through your work. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Sharon, my friend.